Speaking about writing, now here's a person who's really written a heck of a book. Um, who was, wait a minute now, Charles Parsons. I should know, everybody should know that name, shouldn't they, John Lonius? Johnny, I think so. It's so great to be with you, by the way. I started in radio in, in the sense of media, and you uh, were the most famous radio person <laughs> that I knew, so it is a pleasure to actually <laughs> to meet you face-to-face, -face, though we've been emailing for yeah, you know, a long time. months. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very nice. Well, thank you for the very nice compliment. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Well, writing, writing, writing. Now, you, were, you came up... Well, it, uh, first of all, let me say that what, uh, according to what I see here, you are a media and technology executive. Correct. What does that mean? Well, uh, that means that I do a lot of work uh, in commercials and brand films. So if you've mm -hmm. seen work from Panera, we've done work for them, uh, Goddard School commercials. Oh, yeah, I've uh, seen the, that. The BJC work that, that's currently in St. Louis. So um, I, I've had a chance to work uh, across government, education, technology, and, and all media sectors. And so uh, I'm the president of Vidza Media and the chief operating officer of GenieCast. Vidzu. What does that what does that word mean? Uh, so V stands for velocity. Vid stands for video. And zoo, believe it or not, is a Japanese word that can describe telling a story through pictures. So with velocity, we tell amazing stories through pictures, and that's all a part of uh, of our company collective called the Nitrous Effect. Another great name, the there. Nitrous <laughs> Effect. That's uh, something an outer space thing from I, Plan Nine from outer space with yeah. Bela Lugosi. Hey, look at, is that a camera I see over there? Documentation, yeah. huh? Well, camera, yeah, well, we got everything. You have your camera person here, Amy. <laughs> Indeed. And I thank you, Amy, for, for joining your husband. And what about the mental health advocate? Yeah, so I am a hypnotist, so a hypnotherapist. Is so that why I'm feeling so strange right now? <laughs> I, I wondered what was wrong. Well, I get to work with a lot of people, especially around peak performance. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we've learned over the past, you know, 40 years, the power of suggestion, mm -hmm. the power of really, you know, positive thinking. And and uh, that's something that I'm really interested in uh, that, that has been very helpful, not only in business, but also in, in personal life. Great. And then the last, but I, I'm not sure what it means, a world fragrance expert. Yeah, so, so when I was uh, nine years old, I started studying two things. It was martial arts and world incense slash fragrance traditions. And so we, we know that every culture and every religion has had incense uh, since the beginning of recorded history. We know the archaeological evidence of incense is 35,000 years old. So hmm. I get to kind of put all this together across all my projects and all my jobs. Wow, that is fascinating. Now, do you have incense holders, burners, or whatever they are? A yeah, collection absolutely. Of them? I, I have a lot of uh, 17th and 16th century incense burners. Actually, I got to work with uh, Selkirk Auction House uh, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago looking at a lot of their new lots. And so that's one of the things I enjoy doing is is going to small museums and auction houses around the country who who may need some you know extra assistance and really looking at some interesting um, you know, objects that they may have available or in their collection that have been mislabeled. So are most of these Oriental or do they come from other countries? Um, they come from all over. And, and really, that was the impetus for this book. So in 2006, when I arrived at Washington University in St. Louis after six years with a number of different intelligence agencies, um, I uh, was a part of the original crew at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum that was tasked with opening that museum, which opened in October of 2006. And uh, what was really extraordinary about that experience was that I had no idea who Charles Parsons was. And, and Charles Parsons, you know, lived from 1824 to 1905. Mm -hmm. He was a banker, businessman, financier, Civil War colonel, world traveler, author, art collector. But at the time, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And so the, the director of the museum, uh, her name is Sabina Ackman, and she's wonderful. She said, I want to take a look at you know, the 19th century collection that in many ways kicked off Wash U's art collection. Wow. And so we were able to take a look at Charles Parsons' seminal collection of paintings from people like Corot, Church, Gifford, and Innes, as well as a lot of his Japanese and Chinese incense, um, wow. you know, uh, you know, objects. And so one of the pieces in, in the collection was a Tokugawa incense burner. A what? A Tokugawa. So so they were the ruling. What is that? So they were the ruling class of Japan from sixteen oh three uh to about eighteen sixty eight. And it was so but the the bowl, well the the incense burner was labeled as a bowl and, and I turned to her and I said, That's not a bowl. Mm-hmm. 
And she said, what is it? I said, that's a Tokugawa incense burner. And she said, but it says bowl. And and in the 19th century, it was not uncommon for museums around the country to have things that were mislabeled. Right? Well, it happens today. Exactly. It- uh, and, and so she tasked me with writing an essay. And then the essay started the research into this extraordinary forgotten St. Louis. You're not kidding. Extraordinary and forgotten. I've talked, uh, mentioned the name to several people who are historians and they say, I don't know anything about Charles Parsons. Now, the book, The Life and Times of Missouri's Charles Parsons, between art and war. And what does it mean between art and war? Yeah, so for me, when I was looking at really what, you know, what Charles Parsons was committed to was really the, the, the common good and really making a difference for people through education and through art. And if it had not have been for the Civil War to really – um, propel Charles Parsons to luminaries of the day like William T. Sherman and and uh, you know General Grant, who he became close with during mm-hmm. the war and and quite literally moved their armies uh, for success. Uh, Charles would not have achieved the 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 status that that he achieved post Civil War. Hmm. Now, now they are all from St. Louis. Grant and Sherman and Parsons. Yeah, Wait, ab- did, did they know each other here, and were their neighbors? Absol- or? Yeah, well, so absolutely. So that that's a great question. So Charles Parsons lived at twenty eight oh four Pine, which Ooh, not did, far from here, not far just all. west of Jefferson, two yeah. blocks west of Jefferson on the south side of the street. Exactly. But the house is not there anymore. Uh, no, it's actually what it is is that it's the Wells Fargo. Um, a generator right now. That's the, the, that's the exact place where the house was. But uh, General Sherman lived at 912 Garrison, mm-hmm. which was only about five or six blocks right. away. So what's interesting about their relationship, and I and I write about this in the let, uh, in, in the book, is that William T. Sherman learned to landscape paint before the beginning of the Civil War, and hmm. R- Robert Anderson, who who was running Fort Sumner. Um, was teaching uh, General well, Sherman at that time how to paint landscapes. Well, after the war, Charles Parsons was beginning to collect his his landscapes and this and that. And so we can see how Sherman and Parsons became very good friends. There's numerous letters between them, mm-hmm. but they were connecting on art. They were connecting through banking because a lot of people forget that General Sherman was a banker right. in San Francisco. Um, and then also was a quartermaster, which is what Parsons was at, at the beginning of the Civil War. Now, what's a the picture? There's a photograph of a building. What building is that on the uh, front of your book? So what you're looking at there is the first art museum west of the Mississippi, and that was located at 19th and Locust. Just up the street from us, really. Absolutely, yep. And now, unfortunately, it's now just a warehouse. But but uh, that building was torn down, I think, around 1940. Um, but this museum building would eventually go on to become the City Art Museum, which would then become the St. Louis Art Museum, as well as the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University in St. Louis. So what was on display in the original art museum may be partially on display in Kemper or our City Art Museum? Ab- absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so pieces like um, Inoni uh, from Harriet Hosmer. So Charles Parsons supported... A, a female sculptor in mm-hmm. in the 19th century named Harriet Hosmer, who would go on to become one of the first internationally acclaimed female sculptors. And one of one of her great works at the Mercantile Library oh, and yeah. Art Museum. This is fa- oh, fabulous yeah. work. Don't don't ever touch it. People like to touch it. <laughs> and the security guard is always don't touch that. Don't keep your hands to your, put your hands in your pocket. My favorite story about about sculpture and 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 especially Harriet Hosmer was that when I first arrived at the Kemper Art Museum, I didn't have museum experience before I started working at Washington University. Hmm. And one day I walked into the exhibition preparator space and there were about six people taking Q-tips, putting them in their mouth and then and then rubbing down uh, one of the sculptures uh, by Harriet Hosmer. And I was oh like, what? I said, what are you doing? And they said, well, the acid in our mouth is just enough to, to take away the pollution oh. without without uh, damaging the art. It was fascinating. <laughs> that is fascinating. Yeah. That's really incredible. How long did it take you to write this book? Well, oh, so, wait a minute. Let me ask yeah. Amy. Amy, how long did it take him to write this book? <laughs> She's kind of looking at me. Mm-hmm. Um, so... So I started researching it uh, uh-huh. in 2007. And where did you start? Where did the research take you? In what places? Well, so so the research took me all over the world. Oh. Because so if it had not been for Google digitizing a lot of the um, you know collections around 2006, seven, eight, and nine, this book could have never been written because mm-hmm. there's so much information on persons that just wasn't available online. 
And so you had to, you know, kind of, you know, do the regular research trail where you're where, where you're calling different organizations. Mm-hmm. You, you know, the Missouri Historical Society, specifically Molly Codner, uh, has been such a huge support for this. Like she was so, con- you know, kind, uh, you know, to pull out literally uh, 27 boxes that <laughs> the Missouri Historical Society has. Wow. But but it connected me all around the world. Um, and uh, but, you know, it, it took. It took 10 years of research and then a good year and a half to actually write. Write almost every day, I would assume? Uh, almost every day. I And people think I joke when I say this, but I physically injured myself writing this book. How? And just the amount of sitting, oh. the amount of staring. Like, sure. it was my first book, and I didn't know some of the some of the hacks that you can now, <laughs> you know, do to, to kind of speed the process. Um, but it, I, I learned a great deal, and it's such an it's such an interesting book connecting so much to St. Louis and the 19th century, and 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 the positive difference that you know he made in in St. Louis at a time that was you know so vital. John Launius is here. He's talking about his book, The Life and Times of Missouri's Charles Parsons, the guy we're going to get to know, and we'll hear more about all of this. And then in a little while, we're going to. Look back at the 1904 World's Fair and what's still around. You're listening to At Your Service, Johnny Rabbit, KMOX. hope I'm not being hypnotized. You haven't hypnotized me. Do we, does a person know if they've been hypnotized? Yes, or? actually they do. I mean, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions around hypnosis, but it, it, what it ultimately is is that are you open to suggestions that are positive? Have you be more happy, more effective? Um, you know, I, I think that stage hypnosis has done a really disservice uh, to, to what's possible. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're able to, you know, you know, really take on positive thoughts every single day, you're going to be that more effective. And that that's ultimately what it's about. Yeah. Oh, OK. Life and life and times in Missouri's Charles Parsons. Here's your gift. You and Amy for coming here today. John Launius. That's from the Missouri Botanical Garden, or as most people in St. Louis still call it, Shaw's Garden. Love it. So you can go there anytime, enjoy yourself. But what about Henry Shaw and and this Charles Parsons character? Well, so Charles Parsons and and Henry Shaw became friends. And uh, so Charles Parsons was one of the investors in the uh, two Lindell Hotels. Mm -hmm. They both... Down on Washington. Correct. And they both, you know, burned down. And so... When you go to Tower Grove Park and you see all of the stone gates and the area of the park known as the ruins, those all came from the Lindo Hotel. And so Charles Parsons and Henry Shaw became friends through that. And Shaw basically asked Parsons, can you, can I, may I have the rubble uh, from, from, the, from the hotels? And that's what you see now in Tower Grove Park. Interesting. And it's, everybody has seen that. Yeah. With that little lake there, yeah. the, uh, it had a, 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 it was called a sailing pond or something originally. I don't know if anybody sails on it or not anymore. <laughs> I have no idea. Now, you've got a show, a program coming up. When, and then the 5th of March, that's not that far off. Yeah, not that far off. So so at the uh, Chatelon de Menil Mansion on March 5th, uh, I'm going to be giving a talk from 1 to 3. And what's interesting about this is that, yes, it's a book talk, but mm-hmm. it, you're going to get information that either... Either couldn't be put in the book or it's information that I've learned actually after writing it. Oh. Uh, and I'm also going to give a demonstration of pure Japanese incense that relates to Charles Parsons art collection. And most people, when you say the word incense, they think of the 1960s or, mm-hmm. or they think of really right. or they think of bad smells. Well, uh, this is 100 percent natural. Uh, it is unlike anything you have ever experienced unless you, you've been to Japan. Hmm. Um, and so it's it's an extraordinary way to, to move both of these things together, and I'm so grateful uh, to the Chatelon Deminal House Foundation uh, for you know setting this up for for March 5th, one to three. There's a couple different ways that you can participate. Um, for for thirty dollars, you will get the book. You're going to get the experience. Uh, you're also going to be assisting uh, the, the mansion. And so uh, there, there's already a number of people, uh, but we're limiting it to 75 people. So if, if you want to attend, uh, and it's going to be great. So you can do this a couple ways. One, you can go to Deminal.org, which is their website. Uh, you can also send me an email at charlesparsonsbook at gmail.com. I'll say that again, mm-hmm. charlesparsonsbook at gmail.com, and we will get you connected. Uh, but 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 Frederick Atwood the uh, third, fantastic to work with uh, at the at, at the mansion there. So very excited about March fifth. That is that's great, uh, and it's um, 
Well, the book, man, what it sells for twenty three ninety nine, so yeah. <laughs> you're getting, really getting a good deal. Now, yeah. you said things that couldn't be in the book. What does that mean? Well, you know, when you know when you start to write a book, you you, you the publishers will say, well, what do you think the length is going to be? Mm-hmm. And so I said between sixty five and seventy thousand words, uh, and they agreed to that, and they said X number of images. And so there's a lot of images and and a lot of information that. You know, I think is very, very interesting that I think adds to the story that that necessarily couldn't be in the book after editing. And so so the so the so the book talks are a way to expand the conversation. There are ways to, you know, connect a lot of other information. Like we know that Charles Parsons was deeply connected with the 1904 World's Fair. Hmm. But by the time that that fair comes around, you know, he's he's a year away from from from, from, yeah, from passing. Exactly. And so his his adopted nephew, Charles Parsons. Parsons Pettis uh, is is the person who is set to um, you know inherit the the collection and 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 the fortune that he amassed and so there's all these different connections so like for example Halsey C Ives who was the first museum director west of the Mississippi he was the art director for the 1904 World's Fair but he was also the art director for the 1893 Chicago World's Fair and so you start to see this connection between you know the the ways that very large events uh, across the country we're, we're connected, and uh, and it just it's it's a different way to tell the history of not only St. Louis, the region, but also America. But that is very all of this is very interesting, and people will learn a whole lot about St. Louis in this. This is not just a book about a person; it's really about St. Louis. It, it is ab- absolutely, and and also somebody who you know. Charles Parsons believed in art and thought that art was going to continue to expand uh, in a way that would, you know, um, you know, keep his name in the forefront. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it just didn't. You know, he 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 put his money in art as opposed to buildings. You know, his, his uh. one, of, one of his best friends was Robert S. Brooking. And we know Brookings Hall at Wash U. Sure. But we don't know Charles Parsons Hall because there wasn't one. Mm-hmm. But uh, there was Parsons College in Fairfield, Iowa. Which, oh, did he found that college? Well, so so he founded it with with his two brothers at the request of his father. His father wanted to have a Christian college in the Midwest, but he passed away and uh, b- before seeing that come to fruition because of the Civil War and a number of other things, it took them until 1875 to start Parsons College. Now, what's interesting about this is that in 1973, there's a Maharishi that comes along oh, who's, yes. who was teaching the Beatles yep. um, and says, you know what, we're going to buy Parsons College and we're going to make it the the Maharishi Maharesh University. Uh, and there's actually a documentary that will be out later in the year that I'm a part of, mm. um, that um, Dick DeAngelis and and uh, Fairfield Productions put together about the founding of Parsons College. So very interesting. Anything on YouTube that you can see about this? Yeah. So um, I have a YouTube channel for the book. It's just it's just Charles Parsons, and uh, I took one minute excerpts of almost all the chapters of the book, so you can get a glimpse into each one of the chapters again, because it's such a niche historical subject, and 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 Charles Parsons isn't a household name. Right. It gives people the 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 you know a real easy way to say, oh, okay, wow, I am going to learn a lot. This mm-hmm. is going to be interesting. What about uh, Charles Parsons' book? Did he write any books? He wrote one book. Uh, he he wrote notes of notes of travel in 1894 and 1895. It was only for private circulation, so. So there, hmm. there were only about 600 of these books produced. Um, I have one of the original ones, which is actually dedicated to Halsey C. Ives, who I was just talking about with the 1904 World's Fair. So it, it's probably the best one that I could own. How many copies of The Life and Times of Missouri's Charles Parsons between Art and War printed? Um, so, so they're printing on demand, uh, but from, from from what I've heard, so it's a five star rated book on, on Amazon and in and, and in other places online. Great. But, uh, I think there's been at least twenty five thousand. Wow. That that have been printed. That's and, and huge. Yeah, it's huge. But you know, it's what I love about this interview, Johnny, is that is that. You know, the book launched on February 13th, 2020. Mm-hmm. A week later, all of the shutdowns for COVID oh, yes. started. Yeah. And so this this book has really found its way into people's hearts and lives in in, in, in very interesting ways. Um, and so I really appreciate the time today. Oh, we appreciate your time. And thank you. Now, what are you going to do with that video you just done? You're not going to be selling that online, oh, are you? Oh, no, no. I'm going <laughs> to put it up on the Charles Parsons YouTube page right. so, so that, you know, 
people can see our conversation. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Amy, for uh, escorting your associate. We appreciate that very much. Stick around. We're going to the World's Fair. In a way, we really are. That's next with Diane Rodebacher. I'm Johnny Rabbit at your service at KMOX.